in a world torn apart by disaster, a new society has emerged. Scarred survivors band together, their shared humanity, the only thing that keeps them pushing on against the hordes. But amongst this chaos, a new hero has risen. In the tumult of survival, an idiot on a Segway rides around with his tackle in the wind and asks people about board games. This is the Guild. Starring Ben Maddox as the feeble-minded stranger and Tony Boydell as the man with the shovel. Will they survive? Does anybody care? I assume not. But stick around. There's no prize giveaway or anything. It'll just help to massage my incredibly fragile ego. Oh, so they stuck you out here as well? Yeah, sorry, it's getting up my nose. Hang on a sec. <laughs> oh, just... oh, don't, honestly, honestly, I don't know how you can be out here and not have at least a hanky round your, round your nose. Well, this is all I could find, but, you know, you can't What get... did you do anyway? How did, the, how did you end up out here? I stole a biscuit. You know how bloody precious hobnobs are are here, and you know how much the leader desires his oats. I know, I know, but it was there. It was on the table. It was ha- it was half eaten. I thought they were going to throw it out, so uh, I took it. Naivety. It's naivety to think they'd eat, they'd throw out even the crumb of a hobnob, which is now the highest denomination currency in the land. Indeed. Still, I'll be out here in a couple of weeks. Well, I mean, I, I think, the, I mean, I didn't do much, you know. I just um, availed myself of some of the leader's belongings. But, you know, as long as it's not a hobnob, you're basically all right. I'm stuck out here for a couple of days. But it does give me an opportunity to wow myself at the new technology, the way that refuse is disposed of in this brave new world. is it, is frankly slightly alarming, but incredibly exciting. Yeah, I don't know why they didn't think of it before, actually. I mean, this... This could have this could have avoided the whole catastrophe in the first place if we thought about it. Well, we didn't have zombies before, though, did we? No, but we had, you know, ITV Boy viewers. MPs? No, no, ITV viewers. That's true. Yeah, that's true. People who read the Sun. Does anyone read the Sun anymore? I mean, there's a lot of. Not anymore. I mean, beautifully, as part of the uh, breakdown of society, Rupert Murdoch was hung, drawn, and quartered by an angry mob. It was wonderful. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, didn't Cilla Black yeah. come back as well? She did, she did, and strangely, her voice was very similar as a zombie to as she was as a normal human being. I got one of Rupert's testes, you know. I wear it round my neck as a keepsake of that wonderful day. God, I mean, we look back on those times and they just seem so joyous. And simple when, I mean, imagine a time where you could just go out on the street and de-bollock a newspaper magnet and, and be applauded for it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, well. Glorious days. Anyway, I, I mean, you're familiar. Because, I mean, last time we met was in the pub just before the world ended. I mean, what's, what's happened to you since we met last? Well, I've been... Um, well, the family escaped, thankfully. Uh, the problem is they, they forgot to escape with me. So I, I think they're all right. Um, but I've been working on this fantastic aluminium foil suit because it deflects the alien lasers it's beautiful i mean you do look lovely in it it crackles a bit and um it, it'll tell you what is really good if a zombie takes a bat out of my leg it gets the aluminium foil around its teeth and that really gives it that kind of oh shock type thing mm, yeah like like oh when you yeah. fingers down a fingers down a chalkboard exactly and that's, that's the zombie equivalent of fingers on a chalkboard Jack. it is you look like an extra from blake seven look it's not that's stylish, but it's functional. I was just thinking, I was thinking about Blake 7, and I was thinking how so many people, if this ever gets broadcast in any way, will remember Blake 7. I have one word for you. Serverland. Indeed. Anyway, yeah, I mean, we haven't seen each other, but you must have seen me bombing around the uh, compound on the Segway. Oh yeah, you can't miss it. I mean, uh, well, I can't miss it. I mean, I do it nude often. <laughs> it's the siren and the and the blue light. That's right. And um, you know, I go around and I ask people just to take them out of their daily funk, 
I ask them, you know, board game questions. And oh. most people look at me with a, a blank stare. Some are angry. Some are in the grieving process and so throw things at me or attack me with knives. But there are some board game people here. And last week I was going around and I asked them to think back to those heady days before Rupert was debagged and deballed in front of Parliament. And I asked them, you know, if people were being priced out of gaming, if gaming is essentially a middle-class pursuit. Do you think that is true? And do you think those two things are the same thing or separate? Uh, well, I, th I think they're separate. Um, it is true that it's a, it is very mid middle-class. If you think about the kinds of games that we're exposed to all the time, you know, the, the big boxes, the colourful things, the getting them first from, from the big conventions. Um, but there are lots and lots of sort of regular games if you like that are affordable I think um, I think the key thing in our environment if you want to combine the middle class element with the sort of expense if you like the biggest problem we have I think is patience things are expensive for us at the very beginning of that board games life cycle um, and we're not patient so we'll chuck things at it but then if you think about how much you'd spend on a board game in a you know, board games in, in a month. Compare that to if you were just going down a pub every Friday and Saturday night. You know, that'll set you back 50, 50 quid a night. And I mean, do you, think, do you think it's intrinsic to people who are into hobbies that they just spend the money on the hobbies? If I think about golf or you think about footy or you think about model trains or anything like that, you're going to spend the money and you're going to make sure you can spend the money on it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's how you get um, get connected to that that hobby, isn't it? I mean, some of the hobbies you can be directly connected to. So whether it's you know Lego or model trains or board games, you can actually be there and have physical contact and physical interaction with those things. With something like golf, you can aspire to be like the professionals by wearing the same socks as the professionals wear, or holding the same wood as the professional would be holding. Well, often old wood. Nothing to do with golf. Well, I, you should be thanking me for that little feed there. <laughs> talking of so, feed, talking of feed, I think we need to throw another scoopful onto the zombies. Oh, oh go on, can you do it? Because, to be honest, I'm absolutely not. Well, I've just been. You'll have, I'll have to get some from the pile. Thanks. Get some from the pile? What do you mean? You don't put your own in. You don't put it fresh. That, that angers them. Oh. It gives them too much energy. Oh, I'm not going to make it through the next few weeks this way, am I? Hang on a second. <clears throat> God, that was a big scoop for me. I mean, so, I mean, do you think there is this feeling, and do you, to what degree do you think the hobby is people like us who feel this compulsion to get the new games, play the new games, be able to talk about the new games, tweet about the new games, blog about the new games, and to what degree, degree do you think the hobby is just playing games and playing games over and over again and getting a deeper understanding. I mean, when you think about your group, is it primarily one or two people buying all the games and the rest of the people consuming? Uh, yeah, pretty much, actually. I mean, um, I think it was uh, between Ben and myself, we seem to supply pretty much most of the games. Um, me, because I'm an inveterate collector, and Ben, because he's he he's a, has a big throughput of games in the terms of buying games, trying games, trading for games. He has a low sort of tolerance threshold. So if something doesn't hit the spot, then it's out and something else is coming in. So, whereas I am, I'll just be hypnotized by pretty labels or shiny graphics or somebody's na particular name on the box. So yeah, we, we pretty much supply everybody else. I think everybody who vlogs and is interested in vlogs and blogs and all those kinds of stuff. Yeah, I mean, we're the tip of the iceberg, I think. You know, we seem to be the most notable presence as a mass because we're the ones that are out there on social media. But, you know, there's a Facebook group for the UK's gaming community. It has 12, 13,000 members, but you could be lucky if you could scrape together 200 people posting in a week, 200 different people. Um, most people just are involved passively. We just don't see or hear from them, but they're there. I mean, to, to what degree do you get frustrated? And I, I don't think it's a question of, you know, the outlay. Oh, 
look at me, I'm buying all these games and you're not buying them. I don't think that's the issue because I think there is an intrinsic joy in owning them, right? But what I find, the thing that's frustrating about being the person who buys all the games, right, is that I'm the person who has to teach all the games. So it means I have to learn all the games and that I find frustrating. I mean, are you a person who is inclined to it? Do you enjoy doing it? Because frankly, it's the worst part of it for me. Well, yeah, I'd agree with you about the teaching. Um, if you buy a lot of games, yeah, I mean, certain games you could probably get people to, to sort of do their homework beforehand, and, you know, the internet is very good for that kind of thing. But the other problem you get with it, as well as having to teach, is often the reception to the teaching is quite um, critical, uh, I find. And so you get blamed for not teaching things properly, and you get blamed if they don't like the thing at the end of it. And you can end up taking a box back and you put it on the chair and go, why did I bother? You know, I thought this would be good for everybody and I took the time to try and teach it. Now, I may not be, you know, Paul Grogan or Ben Maddox when it comes to teaching a board game to somebody, but, you know, I made an effort. And when you're faced with a table of objections and snarkiness, this is not at all related to any previous experiences I might have had with the local No, I'm sure club. not. Um, it's quite depressing, really. I mean, there, you know, I've suffered the same things as many other people, you know, this pile of shame. And I buy things that I think the club will really like, and I take them along to the club, and they're not very I mean, receptive, and, and, and it's gone forever. I mean, do you think familiarity breeds contempt, though? Because, I mean, you have a game group that is regular, that meets regularly. And it's the same people and you've been playing for years. And there's, there's no one you dislike more than the people you know the best, right? And so do you think... I mean, so you... Do you like the opportunity to play with different players? Just simply because you're not going to get it in the neck from people because they don't know you well enough to give you shit? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think when I was first heavily board gaming in the early 2000s I would be the person who'd come last or second from last in all of these new heavier games that I was playing then I moved to Ross and I could start playing these heavier games and I started winning because you know I I had the experience in these games and I think new players allow you to to win games that you might not win uh, to enjoy certain group thinky types of games where the group think has perhaps got a little stale um, you know, social deduction games, that kind of stuff. You've got the same group playing it. It becomes very obvious pretty quickly that Tony's bluffing or this is a third Monday in, in, in the month, so therefore Tony is not bluffing. And I think, uh, yeah, it can get a bit stale. I think there's so many people out there. To get it back to the subject, I think it, it, we're not really, I don't think we're pricing people out of the market. It, it, maybe you've opened up a new thing here is that maybe our attitude is is sort of, attitudinally pricing people out of the market in, in some cases. I mean, when you think of your group, how would they react to just someone turning up? Oh, very receptive. I mean, we've had a couple of examples where, um, you know, we were in the middle of something that we were excited about and we've stopped it simply to sort of redress the, the, new, the new person. But we are quite forceful personalities and I think we've had a couple of situations where people have stayed with us for a few weeks and I think they got a bit tired of us so we have kind of pushed them away again albeit unwittingly and we're not sort of sitting there going right today we're going to just say the sea bomb a little bit more often just to send that person out but um, sometimes it's who we are that pushes people away. I mean, what is your duty to... If you have a game group that is in a public place, so yours, is, yours was, back in those glory days, in, in a pub, I mean, what is your duty? Is it to ameliorate your behaviour to allow new people to feel included? Or is it, well, this is my game group, damn it. I've been here for 10 years and I should be able to act without restraint because... This is my free time as well as yours. I mean, where do you sit on? I go with the former thing. I think you do have to, to make an effort. Um, otherwise, you things will get stale. And, you know, you'll n never play the games that you want to play because everybody there doesn't like them or whatever. So I think you do have to sort of ease people into it. And I think we've got a couple of guys who've joined us now and they, they keep coming back and they seem to be enjoying it, which is fantastic. Um, they like the banter they like the sort of the way that we play off each other so you know i think that's good i think 
Sometimes it, it's back to that word contempt, isn't it? Familiarity breeds contempt. If you're not careful, you can upset somebody without realising you've done it and then you never see them again. Well, fortunately, the, the lovely Dave Moser uh, survived, which is, which oh, is great. Oh, brilliant. I knew Dave. I saw him back in the day. Well, he's, he's here. He's here in the compound. I mean, once, you, once they set you free here, you can track him down. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. I just, I just um, got to finish shoveling this. I mean, he said he thought you were a twat, but, I mean, you know, we've all changed since the fall, so maybe that's not the case now. But he said to me... No, I'm still a twat. It's all right. He said to me, I actually think there's a low risk of getting priced out of, board, out of the board gaming hobby relative to many other activities. You know, if you want to play golf, play tennis, ride a mountain bike, take up gourmet cooking, all of these require the acquisition of the necessary equipment. By contrast, almost anyone in a major metro area has access to meetup.com groups or similar where they'll be welcomed and invited to join in games even if they arrive empty-handed. Attending conventions is fun but hardly necessary to keep up the hobby. To what degree... What do conventions do for you in your in the way that they sort of cement your identity as a game? Well, I think it's a chance to demonstrate to strangers what you like and what you are like. So, you know, you can you can find other people who like a farming game or a science fiction game. I think it's a chance to maybe reset some of your favourite games, so you're playing with a bit more of the unknown information, whereas a, obviously a steady group will have a lot of cliches with it, a lot of cliquey type stuff. Um, it's a chance Does... to see how many people actually play the games. It's, it's actually quite encouraging to go to a... I mean, I love the UK Games Expo in the evenings, um, albeit you can't get a table to play a board game, but if you wander around those big, big rooms to see you know, nigh on a thousand people at midnight, all engaged in something. It's um, it's fantastic. And I mean, the thing is, I find with conventions that they re-solidify my identity as a game. Now, I don't. I mean. Being a gamer is not my sole identity. It's not the thing I live by. I don't live or die by the fact that I play games or anything. But there's, if you go to a convention and it's good, there's this real sense of belonging. This real sense of a real community that's outside of the small group that you play with. And you realise how broad and how varied the hobby actually is. And... I think that's a shame. I mean, when I look at the UK Games Expo, right, it's not expensive to get in, but I was sponsored by Surprise Stare last year, and I was sponsored by Grand Gamers Guild this year, and there would be no chance I would have been able to have gone to the UK Games Expo otherwise, because it's so bloody expensive to get a hotel room. I mean, do you think there's an obligation on the part of the Expo to make sure that what's happening, which is essentially hotel price gouging, isn't happening anymore. That they can do something to combat that. I th well, I think we'd all love them to do that. And it is a surprise, even as exhibitors at a show like that, that we were never able to get uh, sort of discounted rooms, you know, like there would be a whole suite of rooms put aside for us. You know, we just have to get in the scrum with everybody else, which seems... Well, the hotel, the hotel I was staying at, this year it was the rate for a room was 30 quid more expensive during the expo and I, because on the Sunday night I saw the room rate and they'd lowered it by 30 quid so it's, they are specifically increasing it for the attendees of the expo well they are part of the facilities as much as halls 3 and 4 and whatever they're called at the expo you know same at Spiel you can guarantee that all those prices go up. I mean, when we first went to the Spiel, an Ibis hotel room was 30 euros a night. That was mm. in 2002, 2003. Now it's 90 euros a night, and it's still the same shitty hotel cubicle that you get all, all you know, all over the place. And what we got 20 years ago, six, you know, if I'd written my name on the wall 20 years ago, it would still bloody be there today. Mm. I think uh, unless the UK Games Expo were willing to build their own exhibition centre and build their own hotels to support mm -hmm. that, then they would, you know, they, 
people pay it. Unless people turned around and said, we're not paying it. It's obviously the hotel prices aren't pricing people out of going to those conventions. People are saying, I want to go, I want to go and play. And they're getting through it as much as they can. People like myself, we just claim it off our businesses to do that. Mm. It's... The, yeah, the, the problem is, it's such a shame though, isn't it? Because if people, if it gets too much, which it's conceivable it will, I mean, if you look at Gen Con, it's fucking absurd now, although pe the amount of people going is increasing. It punishes the expo, it doesn't punish the hotels particularly. I just wonder, can the expo say to the hotels, look, you need to do something? Or is that just not possible? I guess, does it not attract enough people to have that kind of heft? I, I don't think that they would get anywhere. And I think, you know, they're quite a few years into the process now. And, you know, if they, if they were going to make it work, they would have made it work, in, you know, already. I think, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I think some of the posts uh, that I've seen in the past about this kind of thing, Really, it's about, if you think about it, if you go to a convention and you spend 100 quid a night, cool, you'd be lucky, but you know, and you meet a group of people, you might end up having a group that you can then take away from that environment and then you would meet more regularly locally. So it could be a, a place where you can forge that relationship and then you don't need to go back to the expo. But there is a real danger, right, for the convention becoming something with just exhibitors and are people above a certain pay level because to attend is just too expensive? Well, in the hotel, certainly, but I think the prices of the door, I mean, what they can do is, is to make sure the door prices never get stupid because people are quite happy to come for the day because the infrastructure is really good. I mean, car parking is quite expensive, you know, 12 quid for the day, but in a convention like that, you know, it'd be better if you all packed yourselves into a car and split the cost and then it becomes really manageable, I think. That's where the expo can, and other conventions can keep, keep the attendance, certainly during the daytime, is by keeping that entrance fee low. I mean, to be fair, actually, to be able to play games at a convention into the early hours of the morning is a bit of a luxury, really. And if you look at the percentage of people who are doing that compared to the overall intake of a convention, it's very small. You know, there aren't 190,000 people in the city of Essen playing games in the evening after they've finished wandering around the halls in the day. It's only a tiny, tiny subset who are, who are going to be doing that. And I guess, I guess the idea is that if you really want to do it, you'll find the money, I guess. So I, I was speaking to Paddy Brophy, Paddy B, and he says the board game scene is actually three hobbies. And I'm going to tell you what three three hobbies that he thinks it is and you tell me to what degree you agree well with. i thought so, he was going to reference uh, the holy trinity there well i mean i mean exactly oh, oh i'm trying to think of three things i can't oh, oh it doesn't matter larry, this. larry curly and mo there you go exactly so he says the hobby is three things so it's playing games owning collecting games and kickstarting games. firstly do you agree with him uh, no, although I can see, I don't agree in the kickstarting element, but I can see why he's doing it because I, I actually made a little bit of a jokey thing about this a few months back, that um, kickstarting games doesn't necessarily mean you're going to end up owning them and or playing them, particularly that latter. Um, but certainly it's playing and owning are, I think they are definitely two separate things. I mean, Jobbers comes to our club and he plays a lot of games with us and he owns maybe three board games total. Um, I own do you, hundreds do you of think games, a point and I only where play you're a say to someone. Look, at least contribute to the well, fucking no. group. Buy me a pint, or is that not a thing? Well, no, because they—it's the time they've given, and they're playing. And when they're not throwing the table and walking out, then <laughs> then it's it's a pleasure to have people around who are willing to play. I mean, it's it's always always comes down to that. People giving their time is the most. The fact that I am an obsessive collector and need to have all of these things. It doesn't mean that John has to pay any extra himself or buy me a drink just because I am who I am. So what does collecting give you? I know you've got this aspiration to open a board game museum, but where does the thrill come? The minute you've got them, does that thrill then subside? Because if I think about it, 
when I buy a game and I'm waiting for it to arrive, that's when all yeah. the potentiality is there. That's when all the excitement's there. When I get it, I open it, I punch it. Yeah. Then that dissipates. Is that the same with you? And is it? Do you collect yes. so much as a matter to reclaim that thrill? Well, yeah, I suppose a psychologist would say that's. It, I'm just keeping that that level of, of endorphins, aren't I? I'm keeping that feedback, that happy feedback. But I do enjoy the searching. I have this goal, and I may never open a board gaming museum, but I'm certainly sort of what's the word? I'm certainly curating that my collection towards that end. So I'm buying things because the theme pleases me, but also because it has a particular place. So I like board game books and I like old board games. I like to see where things come from. I want to show a through line between the, the, you know, the early games of, of, of the 20s and 30s in the UK to where we are now and how Euro games are. You know, I found a, a 1930s card game called Mainline. Lovely condition, a little bit battered, but it's a, it's a, basically it's a tile laying game with railway tracks on it. It's almost an equivalent of sort of dominoes meets metro. You know, it's that kind of thing. That's quite an advanced thing in the middle of the 1930s and 40s when you've got roll and move and you've got sort of miniature war gamey type things, but nothing particular, you know. Um, it's, it's fascinating. But I like this discovering these things as well. That's why I go out to car boot sales and so on. I, I'm not pricing myself out of this market because I'm finding things as cheap as I can find them. Do you think we suffered, do you think the cult of the new prevents us from going back and discovering the history of a hobby? Yeah. Do, you think it's, do you think it's important to know something? I've got a friend of mine who's compiling a list of sort of games you must play or games that are intrinsic to where we are now in the hobby. Do you think that's important? Yeah. If you, if you want to you call yourself a gamer, do you think you should know them? I don't think you should know them, but I think you should have access. I mean, you had this discussion before, but I, th I think it's absolutely right. I think you do need something that gives people reference. Um, everything speeds along so quickly, and this fear of missing out. I mean, the marketing is really good now. If you look at Jamie Stegmaier's tapestry, I mean, you just post up a couple of photos, and everybody's absolutely wetting themselves with excitement. No one has any idea how the game plays. I mean, it's really important with his campaigns that you don't get to see the rule books or the mechanics until you know you've already become so wound up with excitement that you've put your pre-order in. We'll, we'll go on a quick sidebar here we'll talk about this so you know there's been a lot of people talking about this and a, a stink having been kicked up so you as a publisher I want you to think with your publisher's hat on that. so there was a lot of people complaining that Tapestry he allowed the people who received early copies of Tapestry to release overview videos, to release rule explanation videos, to release gameplay videos, but not to release reviews until the first day of the pre-order. And people thought that this felt a little icky. What's your opinion? Um, well, it's not something I would do. I, I'm sort of, I can't avoid but be open and honest about stuff. In, in, in terms of my approach to this, um, if I want somebody to see my game, then I must accept that somebody's going to say something about my game. Um, I don't want to put any caveats on that. I mean, uh, people are giving their time to do these things. Some people are doing it because they, they really, really want to, so it's not a cost to them. But if I don't see putting any preconditions is, is a particularly useful thing. I, I really hate non-disclosure agreements. Is something that really winds me up, you know. It's like either you fucking tell us about the game or you fucking don't. If you want to show it to somebody, then accept that they, they can talk about it. If you don't want to talk about it, don't say a bloody word. I mean, the masters of, of, of that particular campaign are the Fregor boys who are so secretive about their Wallace and Gromit game, they haven't spoken to anybody or appeared anywhere for the last three years. Now, that is avoiding the non disclosure agreement and nailing everything down. On my travels, I, I bumped into a rather angry looking Michael Tan M3 Tan and I asked him the question and after he sneered at me and, and frankly I'm, I'm used to that I'm someone who gets sneered at quite a lot he said I honestly can't think of a cheaper hobby almost any sport or other leisure activity is considerably more expensive if you consider hours enjoyment per dollar or you know 
denomination of your choice, board games are an absolute bargain. If you're talking about miniatures gaming, then definitely some validity. But cardboard tabletop games, he said, with an upward inflection. I'm sorry, I consider the question kind of silly. He said well, to me. actually, I take issue with his, his, his value per dollar or value per pound. The value for money thing, I think, is with new games. I think that is extremely poor. If you think about how many times people play a game now before it's, it's put on the secondary market, it really doesn't merit uh, the amount of money it's spending. You know, if you pay 45 quid for a mainstream, currently popular Euro, and you get two or three games out of it, 15 quid a play? That's a bit poor, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it kind of depends what kind of gamer you are, right? Because there are some people... Well, it's interesting. Um, earlier, I had a game of Through the Ages. And then I wanted something just to end the day off. And I played Solar Fide. And I played that maybe three times when I bought it. And now it's sat on the shelf for three years. But then I just now, because it's a short game and it's a, you know, it's a, it's a really good power thing. I just played it twice in a row. And it's one of those things you, you never quite know, do you? If these games are going to be, are going to have a dollar per play value. Because, I mean, do you ever go through, so you, you must go through this. Because, you know, you're like me, you play a lot of new games and you're learning new rules. Do you ever go through a phase at the moment where you just want to play old games, games you know, and games you just want to sit down and, and not have to go through that initial, uncomfortable, sometimes unpleasant phase of getting to know what the game is? Yeah, absolutely. I think I, I, I look for a good mix, um, and the club is good for maintaining that mix. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to get to play new stuff when I really want to play the new stuff. But yeah, I think so. I think I, I do like the idea of just sort of putting the things on a table and you just play. Um, if, you know, from my point of view, in terms of value for money in a game, as a game designer, I'm trying to make a game that's adaptable, that has variances between plays, you know, all, this, all those things that people demand of a game. It must have replayability. And I'm sure this should be mentioned in a previous guild, but you design all these things in and then people will play a game three or four times and go, well, you know, it's, um, it's, it's fine, I'll, it's on my shelf, but I'm never going to play it again because I'm too busy getting all the new things. And so all that variance, all that difference, all that flexibility is, is kind of wasted. And I think there was an argument that maybe designers should actually say, no, I'm not going to design variability. You know, this game, you can play this ten times and then after that it's going to be a bit boring. But, you know, if it gets to 10 plays, I'll be really, really pleased. I mean, I guess 10 plays is, 10 plays is, is a lot for, for a lot of us. But also this thing about variability. I think, I think sometimes it's misconstrued because people say, oh, the variability in setup, the different hands of cards you can play. But it seems to me there are games, so I played through the ages today, and it's, that game is infinitely variable. And the setup is the same every time. Surely variability comes out of the decision space of the game rather than what you start with in your hand, right? Well, yes, I think that, yeah, that's uh, absolutely essential. But I think also those um, variable setups, those variable progressions in the game, the way the game can go down different avenues, is a much more tangible sort of exhibition of that variability you know if you physically have different cards this game to the ones you had last game then that's a very clear marker that you're getting value for money because you're getting a different game at the same box you're going to get a different experience but that's the point right i think it's a very shallow it's a shallow misinterpretation of what variability is because i mean the game starts differently but then ends up just starting differently and ending up on the same track well it's not variable it doesn't matter what cards are different at the beginning in your hand. If the game is the same every time, then variability is not there. I mean, for God's sake, chess is set up the same every time, right? And that's infinitely varied. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, I, this is a really good discussion point. And I think if, even if you have had it as a discussion in the Guild before, I think you need to have it again, because I think it's worth coming back to. I think there are always new points, but I'd like to go back to, um, Whatever the guy Michael Tan. Is, I can't remember. M Mr. Me Tan, yeah, me M3 Tan. 
I think um, if you think about the secondary market, if you were to subsist purely on buying second-hand games, there is no financial disincentive to this hobby at all. I mean, you can pick up, I mean, you can pick up the latest hotness as of three months ago for half half the price um, that it was being charged for. I mean, I when I get stuff from Essen, for instance, it's hotness, and I get it. You know, I'm sometimes I'm lucky enough to get these things for free. Um, if I put them back into, say, the uh, uh, a bring and buy somewhere. I'll put it in at, at a price I know will sell. That's a really cheap price. So you could pick up um, Altiplano, for instance. I didn't get on with Altiplano at all. So I put it into the bring and buy at uh, the expo for, I think it was 30 quid, which was at the point at that time, it was pretty much 20 quid off the market price. It went within 10 minutes of it going on the shelves. I think the biggest problem people have nowadays is actually the prices look so inflated because they have such a ridiculous postage cost factored in there. Mm. You know, you can get a really good bargain copy of Agricola with all, you know, all the expansions for 30 or 40 quid, and then it'll cost you 20 quid to get the thing posted to you. So then, when you sort of add everything up, it sounds like you're paying a lot. But I think, um, I think the Kickstarter stuff, those big bundles, you know, the Kingdom Death Monsters and the Rising Sun Deluxes and all those things, those things are the exception. I think the main secondary market is no barrier at all to people getting into board gaming. So I want to I ask you about, because when you talk about sort of the idea of is money a barrier to gaming, I think of sort of myself and my desire to have a lot of games coming in. There is, we talked about it earlier, you know, this is intrinsic pleasure in ownership. Do you have that sort of craving for the new and do you find that sometimes that your eyes are bigger than your belly when it comes to game buying i i do i'm not sure it's the same i think i feel because i'm in the industry i get to i, I get to be a little bit behind the scenes which is which is a lot of fun and often it's more fun than the actual games themselves, knowing the people behind them. But I do want things, certain things, but I've, over the last few years, I've begun to go to something like Essence Spiel with the idea of getting the unusual things rather than getting the big box things. And I think this was particularly true, and it started for me about three years ago when Feast for Odin came out. And I, it was on my list when I went to Spiel to get a copy of Feast for Odin. And it was sold out on the first day, and I couldn't get a copy on the Wednesday setup day because they didn't have them delivered yet. And then I thought, hang on a sec, they're going to charge us 80 euros, I think it was, for this thing in English. 80 euros, I could get three different games for 80 euros. If I went over to um, one, of the, you know, one of the stands in Hall 7, I could get something really unusual, in, and only 75 copies of it because that's all they could fit into their suitcases. So I've begun to do that. I've stopped buying all the Japan brand releases. I've now started picking and choosing because it was lovely to have them, but then they would disappear behind the racks of things that were being put on the shelves in front of them for storage. So I, I think my folk, I think I'm a bit more focused in in what I'm looking for. So if it's a second-hand game with a train theme, I'm in. I'm in like bloody Flynn, you know. But if it's a new Uwe Rosenberg, well, you know, I can, I can take a step back and wait. I can have the patience because it will be on the secondary market. If it's any good, it'll be available anyway. If it's not that good, I can pick it up cheap and try it myself. Um, then, so I think I've learned a little bit more patience. Um, but then I don't have a big problem with, with the financing of these things. You know, for me, I can go to Essen and I can quite happily spend seven, eight hundred euros on games. So I was speaking to Colin Utter, Ibn Ul Katab, around, uh, around, he was uh, smoking a fag around by the uh, latrines, and he said, there's a sort of cultural capital necessary to play many games. This isn't just about the money associated with ancillary activities and time, but also educational norms, language, cultural norms, and a host of other factors. These aren't necessarily a bar, of course, and some games undoubtedly have lower cultural capital costs to some people, but it also seems a necessary part of the equation. What do you think cultural capital cost means in this context? I have absolutely no idea. I was going to ask for a translation. I mean, it seems to me what he's what he's trying to say is that 
part of the barrier to entry is a kind of knowledge of certain aspects. If you look at Euro games, for instance, it, there seems to be a need to have at least a passing interest, if not working knowledge, of history. Right. And I know things are changing and Euro games are being themed with other ways, but primarily it's a sort of historical themed thing. And with war games, there seems to be a, a cultural hurdle to jump. Oh, I think it's definitely true with war games. I'm not sure about Euro games. I, th I think, you know, it doesn't matter who the guy is on the front of the box holding a scroll with a ship behind him. I don't think it makes a jot of difference to where you put your worker or which role you take. I think certainly in war games, I think it does help. Um, to have an understanding because it's about those specific events and those specific scenarios about replaying those and you know and seeing if you can at least achieve what was achieved and or perhaps achieve a different outcome you know weigh your strategic skill against history's sort of accounts of it but I think Euro games I don't think there's there's a major cultural barrier at all I think mean, one of the biggest arguments you often get is uh, that's a uh, that's an abstract game with a theme that's been pasted over the top. And this theme just happens to be a bloke holding a scroll. So we've spoken before about, you know, when you got into gaming and it was, it was a particular atmosphere about gaming. And gaming has expanded, it has broadened, and it's brought in different kinds of people. It's no longer the realm of sort of a particular demographic of people doing this thing. Where has that change come from, do you think? What has removed the sort of barriers to people entering the hobby? I think, um, I think it's actual exposure to the games. I think this is, um, certainly in the UK, I can only really speak from the UK's perspective, I think it's shows like um, the UK Games Expo. I think it's games like Magic the Gathering. I think it's those kinds of things that have brought people back for one particular reason, and then they found out about everything else. Expo is famously, you know, 30, 35,000 people over the three days. Um, but the actual percentage of gamers that go to Expo is probably a tenth of that. Maybe three or 4,000 people are actual, what we would regard as Euro gamers. Or, and most of the people that go now are casual gamers or friends or family members. And they are going there and finding out this whole world exists that they never knew existed. Why? Why um, are they going there? Because they're being taken. They're being taken by their friends who play board games. They are being taken by their family members who play board games. I mean, there's precious little exposure to board games in the media. I mean, The Guardian's got Owen that does columns about board games, but there's no standard BBC TV programme. Occasionally, a couple of board gamers turn up on Only Connect. Um, it's it's still not something that's being pushed, you know. And if you if you were to utter the name of, of, of board games in a pub environment, most people would say, "Oh, is that like Monopoly? It's that classic." There's little to no sort of public support for this kind of hobby. But we are we're, we're evangelising. We are pretty good, actually, as a community in evangelising. I mean, I, I think to me, you've seen you've seen over the last ten to fifteen years the broad sort of popularisation of geek culture. And, you know, with comic books and D&D &D and fantasy and all of that sort of stuff, you know, Game of Thrones is a big contributor to this. I have a theory. And games come into this. And you can tell me, and I've, I've, I've talked about this theory before, but you can tell me if it's out of touch. I have this idea that as times become more uncertain, Nostalgia becomes more important because people hearken back to a time where things were simpler. And generally that means childhood. And so they hearken back to an era where they didn't have to worry about politics and they didn't have to worry about prejudice in society. And so those things that they experienced when they were kids evoke feelings of positivity. Therefore, something like board games, which most kids have some connection to, become very appealing for the pure nostalgia aspect. It's only after that that you realise they're an art form on their own and they have an intrinsic attraction that is divorced from nostalgia. How, how, to what extent do you think that's true? I certainly think the nostalgia, I mean, I can only go from my own experience, um, 
when the world outside is getting very noisy, you want to close the curtains, put on the fire and, and watch a favourite film or play a favourite game. I think, I think uh, you know, in the grand scheme of things, this, if doomsday is approaching, then, then us gamers will find solace. Hit Tony already hit. Well, Doom. no, with, you know I can still walk out the door without getting hit by lasers, but that's down to my beautiful yeah, you Blake Seven suit, suits. of course. Yeah, it's lovely. It's um, gorgeous. Well, Tony, thanks very much for uh, having a chat. Oh, don't, don't, don't go close to the edge. Oh, 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 oh. Will Tony survive? Will Ben maybe one day grow a brain cell? Find out in the next exciting yeah, installment of the Guild. <laughs> <laughs>